I first met Judy almost 20 years ago when I was a newly minted college graduate and was in India studying Kalamkari, which is another wonderful textile tradition of South Asia. And Judy was very generous with her time um, and very solicitous of my rather naive questions about traditional textiles and artisan makers. I remember asking Judy to share her thoughts about changing patterns of patronage amongst the Rabari communities with whom she was working. And she said, Kristen, this is not new. I have been living with this issue for decades, um, which is certainly true. <laughs> Since that initial interaction, Judy has become a mentor, a friend, and a colleague, and someone who I eagerly look forward to sharing ideas with. So I'm particularly happy that she's moved to Santa Fe, as I now get to see her more often. Uh, Judy is author of several important essays and books, including The Art of the Dyer in Kutch, which came out in 2021, and her seminal 1995 study, Threads of Identity, Embroidery and Adornment of the Nomadic Rabaris. Um, and this award-winning book um, is certainly thoughtful in its approach and critical in its scholarship, um, and has taught so many of us about the rich and complex practice of embroidery amongst the Rabari community of Kutch um, in Gujarat in India. Um, in addition to sharing her insights in threads of identity, Judy has helped build the collection of Rabari and Gujarati textiles in many museums across the country, including the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe and the Textile Museum in Washington, DC, the latter for which uh, Judy served as Associate Curator of Eastern Hemisphere Collections from 1989 to 1992. In 1993, Judy founded the Kala Raksha Trust, an accompanying museum and design school, which have been models of ethical and authentic engagement with indigenous making communities in Kutch, and for which uh, Judy received a prestigious Ashoka Fellowship for Social Entrepreneurship in 2003, the Sir Misha Black Medal for Distinguished Services to Design Education in 2009, the Crafts Council of India Kamla Award in 2010, and the George B. Walter 36 Service to Society Award from Lawrence University in 2014. More recently, Judy founded Somaya Kalavidya to expand the design education program she initiated at Kalaraksha and for which she has received additional recognition. In 2020, Judy was awarded the Rotary Club of Delhi Premier Distinguished, Distinguished Sur Service Award. And in 2021, she was recognized in Architectural Digest India as one of nine Grand Doms of Craft, which I, I think that's maybe the best award. <laughs> I, could, I could honestly keep going. Judy's accomplishments and influence on the field of South Asian textile studies are truly profound, um, but I want to get to the program at hand. Uh, so without further ado, I'm pleased to turn the mic over to Judy Frader. Um, welcome to Textile Center, Judy. So I will stop sharing and let you share. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I guess I will start by sharing my screen. And um, I can't believe it's been 20 years. <laughs> really, how the time goes. Uh, yes, I remember very clearly meeting you in uh, in Ahmedabad, and and we have interacted in many different ways over a lot of time. So I am very honored to be here today, and uh, I'm really happy to be here for another reason because I think the Textile Center of Minnesota is such a great initiative. It's something that um, other places could aspire to. And I'm happy to talk about folk embroideries of Kutch, which is one of my longest standing and most cherished topics. And I'd, I'd like to begin by establishing some terms of reference. Why am I calling it folk embroidery of Kutch? Why not just embroidery? Uh, and that brings us to what is folk art? And I think uh, we will find many different, different uh, definitions of folk art, um, just to look at two uh, from museums that deal specifically with folk art, the American Folk Art Museum defines folk art as self-taught art, as you can see in these two upper posters, which maybe I would call outsider art. Whereas the Museum of International Folk Art here in Santa Fe 
includes in its vast collections uh, these three Indian objects, um, a Tanjore glass painting, a bronze of the goddess Tara, and a bronze of uh, the god Krishna as a baby. I think there's also, I think I remember also seeing a, um, a miniature painting. And in India, none of these would be called folk art. And so I would say that the Museum of International Folk Arts um, definition of folk art is more non-European art. For me, I will define folk art as art made by people of traditional communities. And now we have a few more terms of reference. Traditional, I, I use uh, to speak of a shared cultural heritage that those people themselves understand. And by community, I mean ethnic group rather than a physical location. So, um, Folk art, folk embroidery is created by artisans for themselves and their families and not for sale. And that's part of why I think I first got interested in folk embroidery is that um, it's an expression of an artisan's life, not influenced by commerce, nor what she thinks uh, an anthropologist wants to or ought to hear. Um, folk embroidery is a reflection of people and it is their language, their cultural heritage. And because of that, folk art has meaning. So when we see folk embroidery, we see the people who make and use it. Um, it's an inextricable part of their culture and it's not fashion, but rather style. And above all, it's an expression of identity. Traditions evolve, um, reflecting people's aspirations and experiences. And because of that, folk embroideries take those inspirations into their own language. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, how folk embroideries express the lives of the people that make them and how they change according to those people's lives changing. Um, so in thinking about folk embroideries incorporating trends, what we can think about is what artisans made, what techniques they used, what patterns and motifs they used, and the materials and colors that they used. And all of these will tell of artisans' lives. Okay, where is Kutch? Here in a map of the subcontinent, Kutch is the pink area, and it is on the border of Sindh in Pakistan, and it's a part of the state of Gujarat of India. And it's a cultural and even a sort of physical island in that the west and south of Kutch are bordered by water, by the Gulf of Kutch and the Arabian Sea, and the north and east are bordered by desert by the salt marsh, the uninhabitable salt marsh called the Run of Kutch and also the Tar Parker. And so because um, it is a sort of cultural island, it has retained very distinctive um, cultures. And Kutch is also a microcosm, I feel. It was a princely state until 1819. And after that, it was under the British rule until 1947. Um, people came to Kutch from the North, from what is now Pakistan and also from the South. Um, and it's a drought prone area. So for the most part, it is not that great for farming, although there are agrarian societies, but a lot of also pastoral societies. And um, these people, provided food and services to the royal family and the urban elite. And it's important to understand that, that the urban and rural people were in contact with each other and visible to each other. Um, agrarian and pastoral societies, in, in those societies, women embroidered in the times between their household and livelihood chores and 
they created in their embroidery beauty for themselves, for their families, for their homes, and also wealth to exchange for marriages. So here in these two images, they're both from the same village, Tundawand, also actually Bopaniwand in the southern part of Kutch, and uh, it's a Rabari uh, village. And on the right, Mongi Ben is embroidering in the afternoon. And on the left, her sister, Rami Ben, is presenting her dowry, which women do, it's called judio in the Rabari community. And it's presented twice, once for the, the girl's family, her, her village, and then for her husband's village. And you can see in this image on the left that embroidery plays a pretty big role in that overall dowry. So each community had a distinctive embroidery style that conveyed its identity and embodied its cultural heritage so Rabaris, for example, are originally um, nomadic camel herders who migrated into Kutch via Sindh centuries ago. And because they're nomadic, um, they remained relatively isolated and um, retained unique customs, including a, a distinctive embroidery style. Their embroidery style is what I call an ethnic style. It is used exclusively by their community and it's named for them. It's called Rabari embroidery. While Rabari uh, style changed over time, it changed uniformly. And here I have three examples of Kanchali backless blouses from the Kachi Rabari subgroup. Um, going from left to right from about 1940, from about 1980, and then from about 1998. And uh, when the styles changed, they changed uniformly. So they retained their ability to express community identity. Um, but it's also important to understand that while this was a shared tradition, each individual interpreted it uniquely. You could read embroidery style, not style, embroideries uh, as handwriting almost. And um, so that, that's the, the combination of the individual within her society. And it's also important to remember that folk embroidery is an art and not manufacturing. For the, the royal, family of Kutch were Jadeja Rajputs and um, like royalty all over India, um, they considered gold and silver thread as high art, the decoration to be used for important occasions. And um, precious metals were used in weaving, which was called kimkab, and also in embroidery, which was called zardozi. Um, the blouse on the left is a conchally, a backless blouse, from the late Rajmata of Kutch, the Queen of Kutch. And it has both Kim Cobb in the lower part, the, the pink background area, and Zardozi in the sleeves on the blue area. And um, Zardozi is, is actually a, an ancient Persian craft that was patronized in India first by the Mughals and then by provincial courts such as the royal family in Kutch and then wealthy merchants and um, in urban centers. Zerdozi was stitched by Muslim artisans. It's really a kind of a couching for those of you. I know there's a lot of textile people here. Different textures of metallic um, elements were couched down and then sequins were added. So the texture really came from the, the uh, metallic elements, okay? Um, there were Zardozi artisans in Kutch. They were not indigenous to Kutch. They were brought in by the royal family, but they left in the 1920s. Similarly, Ari embroidery was a professional craft patronized by the royalty and the elite. Ari work is a minute chain stitch produced by a delicate version of the cobbler's tool, which you can see in the right hand um, photo. And um, it was 
unique to men of the mochi community who, who were cobblers and then became professional embroiderers. So it's also, it's called Ari embroidery and it's also called mochi embroidery. So you have both the technique and the name of the community. Um, and you could see here, it was worked on stenciled patterns and it was for sale to clients. It also was worked on a, um, on a frame, okay, stretched on a frame. Whereas uh, folk embroiderers never use uh, an embroidery hoop or a frame. They just make the tension um, on their knees. In the late 19th, no, in the, all through the 19th century, Jadeja rulers of Kutch commissioned Ari embroidery, um, the finest Ari embroidery stitched with silk yarns on gudgy or satin silk that was imported from China through um, the port Mandui in Southern Kutch. And um, the classic patterns were influenced by Mughal and Chinese art. So these are again, two pieces from the collection of the late Rajmata, the queen of Kutch. And on the left is a skirt, a ghagro. And on the right is the border of a uh, tablecloth. I was very fortunate that she allowed me to photograph um, some of the amazing embroideries in her collection. So in the, these, um, classic mochi patterns, you see Chinese and maybe Mughal influence the, the uh, stylized flowers in the skirt on the left and um, a shading of red to pink and dark blue to light blue. And in between the flowers, you see these uh, kind of curling vines and then the booties um, here, buta or booty, depending on the size. Uh, which are like bouquets of flowers and the peacocks, which I will get into a little later. And here you see the same thing uh, or similar work actually in the border here, except that the vines have become parrots. Um, what's really interesting, which I learned from the Rajmata, is that these Ari garments, which uh, garments and, and household embroiders, were, which were so closely associated with the royalty in Kutch, were actually considered second class art or made for little occasions or daily use even. And according to the Rajmata, they were only worn a few times and then they were passed down to village born servants. So villagers such as Ahir or Kanbi agriculturalists, and these are images of Ahir's at a wedding, um, they saw this mochi embroidery and it was not only beautiful but it was also associated with the elite and so they emulated it. Um, so I think we have to understand that um, the influences of both Sordozi and Ari work flowed from higher status groups to lower status groups but with revitalizing mutual exchange, which I'll talk about a little bit in a few moments. So you can see this at this at a wedding, the little girl sitting behind the groom in the right hand photograph is wearing a skirt with motifs that are very much like what we saw in that um, Mochi Gagro from the Raj Matas collection. So um, the agriculturist Ahirs and Kanbis adopted the mochi style, but they used their own coarse cotton cloth, what was available to them, and cotton thread, and they stitched with a straight needle. And so what they were doing, really, they were translating mochi work into their own styles. Here I put again the, the Rajmata's Gagro, and you can see that uh, the peacock in profile is very similar in the um, Chaklo, the wall hanging by a, a Kanbi artisan. The booty has become in, um, simplified into uh, a single flower, but using again that shading of red to pink, dark blue to light blue. Um, and in the piece on the right, this is a Wawani. The Ahirs are farmers, and uh, the Wawani is tied at the waist. It's actually like a portable pocket or a bag. And the farmer keeps seeds in the pocket and throws them into the field while walking. 
And here we see the um, that same kind of stylized flower with red and pink um, in the border. Okay. So I think um, the uh, here, uh, sorry, the mochi work became a regional style and it was shared by urban elite and rural communities. And what um, really most distinguished the urban from the rural was the exigencies of economic and social status, the materials, um, and also a bit the technique, but I think materials are, have a more, um, a greater impact. Okay, here's a zoom in of Kutch. It's indigenously understood as uh, four subregions, Bunny and Pacham in the north, Garuda in the west, Wagard in the east, and then the heart of Kutch. And in each of these subregions, there are what I call regional styles of embroidery that are shared by communities in, in the, the region. And they reflect the historical, socioeconomic, and cultural factors that shape the subregions. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand that each folk embroidery had both ethnic distinctions and regional uh, um, characteristics. So the, the play of ethnic and regional really articulates the place of that community, the relationship of that community with other neighbors in the region. The nomadic Rabaris um, live in three subregions of Kutch, and so their embroideries very uh, well illustrate the play of regional and ethnic elements. Rabaris practice, again, a, an ethnic style of embroidery, but with regional elements incorporated. So the mochi influence was strongest in central Kutch, and I'm showing you two, again, another skirt from the Rajmata's collection, and then two embroideries from the Devra Rabaris, who um, also live in central Kutch. And you can see that um, in this skirt, this mochi skirt from the Rajmata collection, we have a peacock again facing front and dancing. And then in the border, a sort of uh, stylized, simplified version of that motif, just the wings and the tail. And it's, be it's become a sort of flower. So that is um, now alternating with the flower that we saw earlier. And the vine has here become parrots flanking those um, floral elements. And in the Debra Rabari Batwa, which is a fold up purse on the right, you see here, I hope you can see my pointer, uh, very similar to this um, sort of um, stylized um, peacock tail and wings. And here we have in between stylized parrots, okay? Um, in this Aden, which is a groom's jacket, this is from the back of it, we see the circular flowers. And um, what I also want to show you is that the folk embroidery styles vitalized the urban elite style. Um, the flower in, is in, now made with mirrors. There are lots of additional accent stitches um, and it becomes very vibrant. And here is what I, where I want to show you what I think is a, a mutual exchange. If you look at the peacock, um, even the parrot, they don't really, I mean, the, the, the technique is the same because it's done by mochis. But if you look at the, the, the motif visually, it really is quite different from the more Chinese or Mughal floral, booty, formalized motifs. And I would venture to say that it very well, the, the peacock and the parrot could have in fact been incorporated from the folk embroidery traditions. Um, two more 
Rabari subgroups, the Kachi Rabaris in the west on the left, and the, the Wagadi Rabaris in the east on the right. Um, again, it's an ethnic style with regional elements incorporated uh, and a, a more maybe diluted uh, influence from the mochi embroideries of central Kutch. Um, the, the Kachi Rabari work is more angular and more um, narrative, I think. You see these kind of narrative um, motifs in the center of this dowry bag. But then you do see this floral um, motif of mochi embroidery and the stylized parrots. And in the uh, Wagari Rabari uh, embroidery, the regional uh, style of Wagard is very bold, large motifs, very dense embroidery and a predominance of yellow and white. So that is shown here uh, in the, the ethnic Rabari style. And also, if you look carefully, it is uh, another interpretation of mochi embroidery. We have this flowers, the flowers in yellow and white, um, quite stylized, and in between a very, very stylized parrot on either side. Okay. In the northern uh, region, subregion of Kutch, um, it's very arid and um, not suitable at all for farming. So the inhabitants are Muslim Maldaris who are cattle herders. There are a lot of subgroups of Maldaris in the upper left and the lower right are two images of Maldaris. Um, and then we have the Hindu leather workers, the Megwals in the upper right and the lower left. And these communities live symbiotically and the close interaction of communities is expressed in shared regional styles of embroidery. And these styles are not named for the community, but named for the technique. So the predominant regional style in Bunny Pacham is Paco. And Paco means solid, and it is an embroidery style um, stitched in a tight, Chair, cha uh, square chain stitch or double buttonhole stitch with some accent stitches as well, a lot of flowers. And uh, the legend of Paco is that it is so sturdy that it will outlive the background fabric on which it is stitched. And I have seen examples of that actually. So uh, the um, Paco was originally concentrated in Samroti, which is the Indus Delta region of Southern Sindh. And here is a Lohana Paco Conjuro, a backless blouse that is not yet, it has not yet been stitched up um, from about 1950 from the Samroti region in Sindh, what is now Pakistan. Paco was brought to Bani and Pacham in, by the um, Maldaris and Megwals who migrated into the region in the 16th and 17th centuries. And on the right, you can see a, a Megwal version of Paco embroidery on a conjuro backless blouse. Now on the left, we have a child's garment, a cholo from the um, Sameja sub, uh, uh, clan of Mandaris, and it incorporates muko into Paco embroidery. It's a sort of sister style. Muko uses metallic um, elements, not actual gold and silver, but emulating synthetic versions, and it emulates the royal Zardozi embroidery. And here you can see the, um, the muko is used to create a gold ornament for the child that will wear it. Souf is another regional embroidery style and it is a counted embroidery. Um, it's a satin or surface satin stitch that is worked counting on the warp and weft of the fabric. And it originated in Dot, which is the Eastern area of Sindh, which is now in Pakistan. 
um, because it's counted, it's very geometric. And here are two examples, a souf bokani worn by a groom. It's a scarf worn over the ears. Bokani means two ears and chin. And on the right is a wahani, which is a money belt also used in a wedding. And uh, Sufi embroidery came into Kutch first in the dowries of Rajput brides from Sindh marrying into Kutch, but more significantly in with um, refugees who came after the Indo-Pak War of 1971. They came into Kutch in 1972, Hindu refugees. And in the lower right, there's an image of two Maro Megwal women who migrated from Pakistan in 1972. And the woman on the right, Mira Ben, is, is um, embroidering in Suf embroidery. And if you can see, she's working from the back of the fabric using a surface satin stitch. So the uh, royalty of Dat, where Suf originated, were Soda Rajputs. And like royalty everywhere. They uh, expressed their status in silver and gold thread fabrics. And to maintain that status, they did not allow lower caste rural communities to wear um, gold and silver brocade. And there's um, the uh, Kim Cobb, Conchali on the left is again from the late Raj Matav Kutch collection. However, it would the similar garment would have been worn in Dot. So the Maru Megwal community who lived in that area and whose men wove emulated that tin cob, that um, gold brocade, by stitching in surface satin stitch and making souf embroidery on fabric in a very similar blouse you can see here. Um, so that, that's how they, they did the workaround from not being able to wear the gold and silver brocade. And there's a Maro Megwal woman down below who would have embroidered a blouse like the one above her. So, um, all uh, Soda Rajputs could not be royalty. And uh, the lower women of the lower ranks also embroidered. They also embroidered in regional styles. Um, it's unclear who taught whom Suf embroidery or Paco embroidery. But I think it's more important that to understand that these embroidery styles were shared as regional styles. Now, remember um, when we talk about adopting trends, we can consider what artisans made as well as the techniques they used and the patterns, motifs, colors. Um, so if you see this uh, Mughal miniature um, from the 17th century, you'll see that courtly dress included for men, portly dress for men, included a cummerbund, which is wrapped around the waist and a draped shoulder cloth. And here is a, an image in the lower left of a village wedding in 1990, in which the groom is wearing a very similarly draped shoulder cloth. And he, the one that he's wearing is woven, but previously um, would have been embroidered like the, the image above, which is a Suf embroidered um, Soda Rajput shoulder cloth. I'm going to give you two more examples of ethnic embroidery styles reflecting ancient historical origins. The Mutwas are a small group of uh, Muslim Maldharis in the Northern region of Kutch. They inhabit about 11 villages, and they are recognized locally as culturally distinct from the other Maldaris of the region. They all practice cattle herding, and but culturally the Mutwas are distinct, and they claim that their origin is in Arabistan. 
Now, if we look at the mutua embroidery, it's very different. It's uniformly um, minute and renditions of local um, regional styles. There's a sort of a paco. Uh, here we're seeing an interlaced baoliu and also karak, which is another satin stitch style. I didn't tell you all of the regional styles, but the, the mutuas are uniformly, they use a uniformly um, unique, uh, minute uh, rendition of all of these styles. And uh, if you see, um, this is a, a catalog cover from an exhibition that I saw a long time ago of Saudi Arabian embroidery. And it's striking the similarity in the tiny uh, square chain stitching and also the use of yellow, um, sorry, orange and white. And it sort of um, lends credence to the Mutwa claims of their origins in Arabistan. The Jats are also uh, Muslim pastoralists who originated outside of the subcontinent. Um, there are three subgroups of Jats in Kutch and uh, Danata, Fakirani, and Garasia. But in all three communities, the women wear a gago, which is a long gown with an embroidered yoke. And this is a garment that's not worn by anyone else in Kutch. The uh, Fakirani and Daneta Jats practice um, a sort of a variation, maybe it's an ethnic variation of Paco embroidery style on the right side you see. Um, it includes a padded satin stitch and also these typically these kind of pinwheel motifs. However, the Garasia Jats practice a, another counted stitch embroidery is a, a variation of cross stitch, and that's unlike anything else in Kutch. And Jets say that they migrated from um, Halab, which is today's Aleppo. And if you look at a Syrian Bedouin dress, it's very similar to a gago, and it's also decorated with a cross stitch embroidery. Royalty no longer influenced village styles, but urban influences persist in folk styles. Um, during the 1980s, the village men of Kutch began migrating to Gulf countries to do manual labor. The influx of cash and the experience of international travel was expressed in new status symbols, such as imported synthetic fabric. Um, the screen pin printed, pink screen printed fabric was particularly um, fashionable during that time. And you can see that it's used here as a woman's um, baby carrier or veil. Um, it has a double use, but it has rabari embroidery on either end. And I, you can see how the women um, chose colors from the imported fabric in their embroidery. I think that's really wonderful. And they called this fabric muscat. Um, also as synthetic um, variations of traditional fabrics became available, such as see the, in the uh, right-hand photograph, there's a man wearing a um, uh, machine woven um, synthetic acrylic shawl and the groom, this is a wedding picture from the Rabari community. The groom is wearing a, a polyester um, variation of mushroom, which would originally have been the ceremonial shawl. So when these uh, synthetic substitutes came, became av available, artisan families started to adopt them. Um, partly as an expression of their becoming more modern. Motifs embroidered also articulate lifestyle trends. The traditional motifs sometimes morph and are renamed and they record cultural history. The Paniari, and this, this is an embroidery from about 1960. It's actually the first slide that I showed you. Uh, Paniari is here. 
It's a woman carrying water pots on her head. And now in 1985, it morphs into Shrawan, the mythical Hindu ideal son who carried his blind parents on a pilgrimage. So there's been a gender change here. But also what we're seeing is um, it, women are no longer required to pull water from wells. They have taps. They're no longer having to carry water pots on their head. So this um, motif is no longer so relevant. And at the same time, the Rabaris are um, assimilating into more mainstream Hindu culture. And on the, the similarly, the motif here on the right is a hati, an elephant ridden by a royal groom in procession that has lost all cultural relevance. Those are <laughs> grooms are no longer riding elephants in even royal grooms in Kutch. And that motif has morphed into a cupboard, which is a symbol of prosperity and settling. Okay, now a little bit about technique. As uh, women began working, had more time, uh, less time than money, the folk artisans began to adopt pervasive values of fast and convenient fashion. And facing time limitation, they calculated their efforts. And I think it's noteworthy that they did not choose um, industrial production solutions that were available to them, such as embroidering on printed patterns to achieve speed, consistency, and minimal cost. Instead, they found um, strategies that would minimize their effort, but retain their creative agency. Um, here are two examples from Rabari in, uh, communities. The upper right is from the Kachi Rabari subgroup. And what the Kachi Rabari women did was they began to use zigzag sewing machine embroidery. Um, they put it on the, the tightest uh, setting and made this very tight <laughs> outlining that emulates their tight square chain stitching. And then they outlined, whoops, let me go back. Sorry, they outlined uh, their traditional motifs in zigzag stitching and then added hand embroidered details. So here in, I, I think probably you wouldn't have noticed this if I didn't tell you. Uh, here the outlining is in zigzag machine stitching and this detailing is in hand stitching. So that cut their time in half. And for the Debra Rabaris, it was a much more dramatic um, change because it was came from top down. The Nat, who are the elder men of the community who um, dictate the rules, declared a hand embroidery banned because they said that women were spending too much time on it and uh, they could therefore no longer do hand embroidery. So women from the Debir Rabari community came up with an entirely new uh, art form to compensate. They started using sewing machines, which were within the rules and ready-made elements of ribbons and rickrack and trim. And both communities rejoiced in having to use less time and being able to create more um, embroideries. It was sort of like a Pandora, Pandora's box. And, uh, but I think that what's important is that in both of these examples, the artisans retained their aesthetic and their creative agency. So the two critical factors are that folk artisans are making their own traditions and they are expressing the times in which they live. For us, what's striking is the persistence of expression and style. Despite changes in technology and the advent of fashion, visual expression of group affiliation remains clear. And urban fashion continues to borrow from rural folk traditions. Here I have three examples, and all of these are for commercial markets so I think because folk embroidery was not originally for sale, 
This begs us to consider the issue of cultural appropriation. The first example on the left is uh, a contemporary dress fashioned from existing folk embroideries there. I think you might recognize that this is a um, Conjuro backless blouse from in Paco embroidery from the Northern Bunny region. And then there are other embroidery, uh, folk embroideries cut and pieced into this garment. Okay, the second uh, example, and unfortunately I don't have an image of it, but I remember very clearly in uh, the mid 1990s seeing an image, I was astounded actually, an image of a Chloe collection clearly lifted from Sufi embroidery tradition and, uh, without even very much <laughs> adaptation. Um, and then the third example is not from India, but it's very similar. And I think it's pretty well known. Dior on the left um, copy, um, copied, made a uh, jacket, which copied a traditional jacket from Bihor on the right, uh, Bihor in Romania. And there was a great uproar from Bihor and it put Bihor on the map. Um, but I think in all these examples, we have to ask, are they all cultural appropriation? It's a complex issue, but I think as the saying goes, what you have to do is follow the money. Who, who earns, who um, earns the money, who benefits, and who is recognized? So finally, I would like to present an alternative scenario. What if, folk artisans aim for the contemporary market rather than just reflecting it? What if they use their own cultural heritage to themselves earn recognition as well as income? In 2005, I began a design education for traditional folk artisans of Kutch toward that goal. And finally, I'm going to present to you five um, traditional folk embroidery graduates of the year-long program in design education and, uh, and their work. Um, the work was consciously designed for urban Indian markets. And in all cases, the embroidery expresses their imagination, the individual's imagination. Oops, sorry as well as um, the core of their traditions as they understand them. And I, I think it's important that artisans get to say what their traditions are. Um, there's Sajinu Ben Rabari, Debra Rabari woman on the upper left, and next to her, uh, an embroidered jacket that she made with very bold, stylized um, elephant motifs, actually. And Mongi Ben below, a Kachi Rabari embroiderer, and next to her, a jacket that she designed and made. And I think some of you might notice that it's the same jacket that I'm wearing. And then finally, three Suf embroidery folk artisans um, from the Maru Megwal community who migrated from Sindh in Pakistan in 1972. Um, uh, Lakshmi Ben and Tulsi Ben on the upper left and Tulsi Ben again next to her and then Tara Ben down below and two of the exquisite um, contemporary Suf embroideries that they have made. Um, and you might notice that I am wearing that we peel. Um, so I, I believe that these artisan designers, and by artisan designer, I mean artisans who have graduated from a year long course in design. I think that they embody the essence of folk traditions. They are chronicling their world and they're using their creative capacity as well as their skills. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Judy. We have time for questions. Um, and so I just encourage anyone who has a question to please add your question in the chat or at the Q&A bar at the bottom of the screen. We have one question that came in earlier from, uh, from Kate. Uh, 
Kate Daly, you mentioned that embroideries were for domestic use. Afghans traditionally followed a similar pattern until economic sustainability was a challenge. They were, quote unquote, allowed to embroider from more commercial outlets and local markets. Have there been any similar instances in your research? Oh, absolutely. I, I think um, <laughs> folk embroiderers were, um, but see, the, the, the early um, examples are <laughs> that folk embroiderers were employed as laborers. Uh, this is why I started first Kalaraksha and then the design school. It, it outraged me that they were employed as laborers in sort of homogenized um, versions of their own traditions. Uh, so yes, that, that happens. And you know what also happens is that um, the artisans are exploited because they don't have they, since they never worked for commercial markets, they don't have any way to gauge what the value of their work is. Even in Kalaraksha, when we uh, we had pricing committees from the artisan communities and we had them price their own work, but there was a little glitch in that they didn't know, they didn't have enough experience to know how to value their work. So. It's a it's a prime opportunity for exploitation, and you know women got very minimal payment for their for their work. Thank you, Judy. I was so um, I was so there are several things that you talked about that really um, stuck with me. Certainly, your working definition of folk art is one that I wanted to on for a while, <laughs> and I'm glad that you um, emphasize change. Um, as, as really at the heart of that. And I, I'm also glad that you brought up cultural appropriation. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I think that you're right to identify the money, um, the visibility, the acknowledgement, the power, um, where does that lay? And that's really how we can start to understand maybe a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural celebration or sort of authentic um, collaborations. Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about sort of thinking about this question of cultural appropriation and maybe collaboration, um, I know that you have uh, led and, and helped facilitate collaborative workshops between artisans in Kutch and artisans in Oaxaca. And I was reminded when you talked about the Wipil that, uh, that Tara Ben had made, um, just that the name Wipil itself, right? Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about in those kinds of, in those workshops and those partnerships, how, how you, how you navigate this question of cultural appropriation? How do you how do you um, engage um, in in sharing of ideas um, in, in that in that case, sort of across um, across cultural communities and contexts? Well, I, you know, the approach that I've taken is that it is cultural heritage. It belongs to the artisans. They get to determine what the parameters are. And there's healthy healthy discussion of that now in, in our design education program. Um, and it's important that they retain their agency. So um, in our design education program, we stress innovation within tradition. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. First, know what is your tradition so that when you innovate, you strengthen it rather than uh, um, obliterate it, right? Uh, but, but again, artisans themselves get to determine what's okay. And when we have done, um, we've done several, it, within India, several um, outreach programs where we have graduates of of the design program work with artisans of other traditions. So um, for embroidery, for example, we worked with artisans in Lucknow who do chicken embroidery. It was very interesting to see how uh, local people were very anxious. They were very threatened. They were like, what are you going to do? You're going to teach the, uh, the Kutch artisans chicken embroidery or teach the chicken artisans Kutch embroidery. And we're like, no, the artists, I didn't have to say much. The artisans, the Suf embroidery artisans said, no, that's not what we're doing. We're teaching them how to innovate within their own tradition. So they own it and they, they um, yeah, they get to be creative, which is what they love to do. And, the, and with Oaxaca, that was a little different um, because 
Well, because yeah, the, it was farther, I guess, farther, uh, farther reach, but um, together, like in the example of this repeal, uh, Tulsi and Tara um, worked with, and, and Lakshmi worked with long distance. They never got to meet. Um, through Zoom and, and uh, WhatsApp. They exchanged images of their work, they discussed, and they came up with a common theme. So the theme for this repeal is actually uh, coral reefs because um, Tulsi and her partner realized that there are coral reefs in uh, outside of, on the coast of Oaxaca and also on the coast of Kutch and that they're endangered. So they wanted to kind of focus on that. And then they, they did their own interpretations. That's fabulous. Um, thank you. Um, there are a couple other questions here. Um, this is from Kushbu Matur. Um, I must say that many of the artisan designers in Kutch are doing incredible work, but they are struggling themselves to position themselves independently in the market and scaling up their work. Um, and hoping you could share your views on that. Well, as soon as you say scale, I start to bristle because if it is folk art, if it is made by an individual, there is a limit to the scale, right? Um, and, and we are not manufacturing, right? We are making art. So the production is going to be, I don't even, yes, this was interesting. When I gave a talk in uh, Wisconsin last year, someone questioned me on production and I said, ooh, you're right. Let's not call it production, let's call it creation. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> positioning, yes. Positioning as, it's a, it's a uh, uh, pretty um, competitive market. Um, India is lucky that it has a vibrant domestic market, but it's quite competitive and, um, I think, I think we have to now start looking at the market, you know, um, how do we educate consumers to appreciate what folk art is, what folk embroidery or weaving or uh, any other textile or other craft is um, and how to appreciate it. Uh, positioning though has to do with marketing. So it is, it's very, very complex. Um, how do you market without, again, throwing the baby out with the bathwater? You can succeed in marketing to the extent that you make marketing more important than, than the product, right? So um, I think, I do think that, say, for like Tulsi and Tara and um, Lakshmi, who are individual Suf embroiderers. They use Instagram and Facebook and tools like that. They go to exhibitions. Um, so that's how they are trying to find people who appreciate their work. Yeah, and that, that in some ways answers another question that came in from Bonnie Christensen. When visiting Gujarat, where can we go to see and perhaps buy the embroidery? So maybe you don't even have to go to Gujarat. We can just open up Instagram. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but if you if you wanted to speak to that, Judy, I know that there's there are lots of different ways to answer that. But um, if you have any thoughts um, specifically on um, on how opportunities in Gujarat where where this work might be available for those who are visiting? I think it's a good question because generally when people come, they are ushered to meet the few superstars who people often think are the only artisans. Um, that's a kind of marketing, right? But there are many, many, many artisans um, as even artisan designers, graduates of the education program, there are more than 200, okay, from different different crafts, okay? So if you want to see embroidery, um, I would say contact Somaya Kalabidya, get names of people, go and visit them in their own environment. Uh, that also gives you an understanding of what, it's not just a product, right? It's an expression of a cultural heritage and a community. So when you go to meet the artisans in their homes, 
um, see how they live, then, then you're buying, if you're buying, a part of their, an experience, right? It's not just a product. Is that, is that a good answer? It's a good answer, I think. <laughs> I agree. Um, I think we're going to have to end. We're at 106, but I want to just thank you, Judy, so much for sharing your uh, time and your expertise and your perspectives, which um, each time I hear you speak, um, it's always something new and um, thought provoking. So I just um, am, am so grateful for, for you being here and thank you again. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, and uh, and hope to see you hope to see you all soon at Textile Center if you're up north. Thank you again. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everybody. Great to see all these familiar names and faces and some new ones. <laughs>